Uh, welcome to Boardroom Buddha, the show that shares the lessons and hard-earned wisdom of entrepreneurs and tries to find answers to how, why, and what were you thinking. I'm your host, Ray Appen. Joining me today is Bob Klein, CEO of Digital Scientists, based here in Alpharetta since 2007. The motto of Bob's company that I pulled from his website is, we build products that we'd love to use. And I thought that was a, a great introduction, and, and I'll let Bob um, talk to us about what, what products does he build? What, what does digital scientists do? What business are you in? Thank you, Ray. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, being on your program today. Um, I think that uh, the business that we're in is at uh, Digital Scientists is really helping people launch, uh, launch new products. Uh, oftentimes, um, people come in and they, they want to launch a product. It could be a, a mobile app or a website or uh, e-commerce application, and they need some help to get started. So the honestly, the best way to think about us is um, we help people launch new products, okay. right? new digital products primarily. And um, so from our point of view, our uh, we think that... Um, our business is really to help our clients or partners get a measurable return by uh, improving the human experience. So there's a there's a little bit of kind of underpinning there. Of we think that improving an experience in a digital product will create a value, and that return can be realized by our partners. So um, that's a kind of a different take on it. Instead of just creating a thing, we're really trying to improve the user's experience. Uh, and a better user experience will create a better return for our for our partners. A better result. Mm -hmm. Okay. What um, can you can you talk to us a little bit about the history of Digital Scientists? Sure. the uh, The company got started in two thousand seven. Uh, my brother and I started the company, and we were initially located down in uh, Virginia Highlands in the in Atlanta, uh, down in the Zone Light Road area. Um, we were, um, my brother was, you know, this is my identical twin brother, Tom, and he actually comes out of a kind of a marketing background and I came out of an IT background. Um, and we wanted to start a digital marketing firm at the time, right? This was before uh, the iPhone existed. Feels like ancient history for some of us. Um, started the company and we wanted to make something that was very uh, approachable, understandable, um, Part of our job has always been to help explain some of these kind of uh, complex concepts. So that's how we got started. And very early on, we realized that we like to build things. You know, we weren't necessarily that interested in all the marketing aspects. And my brother had always been interested in technology. And this was where um, kind of where, you know, marketing and technology were coming together. But there was a need to be able to create these platforms, these products and such. So... Um, I would say a year or two into it, we realized we liked creating platforms and things that are a little more complex so we could deliver an experience. Uh, that's how we got started in 2007. We uh, expanded to Alpharetta in 2009 um, and found this great spot on Main Street and have, have been there ever since. We actually closed down the office in town um, not long afterwards and then have been this entire time in, in uh, downtown Alpharetta. Uh, I should add that last year I went back, I've gone back into Atlanta and opened an, an office in Atlanta. Okay. Um, because the city is so darn big, uh, Alpharetta um, and the whole metro Atlanta area. So we have to cover, really support clients throughout metro Atlanta. That I, I, that I wasn't aware of. Um, so are you, so you've staffed up to man both, man or woman both we, offices we we have and and my, my point of view is that i really i don't want people spending a lot of time on the road right the the work that we do is difficult and um i want people to be home every night and to have a short commute and um you know i just we had to grow large enough to where we could create an office down there and staff it and honestly um we have a mix of product managers uh, product designers and developers, and it's very important to me that they all work together. We're a uh, very you know close team, 
Um, so it's it's caused us a little growing pains to have those two locations, but we're we've kind of gotten past them last year. So um, I've been very happy with uh, where we're located. We're down in the um, the old Biltmore Hotel right there on Fifth Street next to Georgia Tech. So uh, okay, it's right very very different vibe. Heart but, of Tech. Right, uh, right there, and they, some people call it Innovation Alley, but uh, um, it's a nice change of pace. But it it does make for sometimes <laughs> some long drives. I won't uh, kid you. I bet we. Um, I just interviewed um, Karen Cashin mm -hmm. with uh, Tech Alpharetta, and one of her comments to me was that I assumed that she she worked with a lot of millennials, and she said abs actually of the fifty one um, incubator clients. Mm -hmm at Tech Alpharetta, not a single one of them is millennial. Um, she said most of her clients of, or, or clients of Tech Alpharetta are more seasoned um, corporate types mm -hmm. who might have worked in healthcare or tech and wanted to go out on their own. Is that consistent with who your clients are? Or how do you, are you similar or are you a lot different? I, I guess, you know, um, I should explain that we tend to work with three different types of clients, right? One would be um, a startup CEO that maybe had some seed funding and they are making a decision about how, how to get a product to market quickly or how to, how to create an MVP, a minimum viable product. Okay. And really they're trying to um, validate their concept. They're trying to learn, is this, you know, do I have the right product idea? They may have um, they may have a hundred thousand dollars or seventy five to hundred thousand dollars, which I know sounds like a lot, but uh, this would cover really the the product design and the development in a constrained period of time, let's say three months, okay. and get something out and launch to a market test, right? So uh, not to the whole world, but maybe to a very um, defined pilot audience and something you can do quickly. So. The uh, we find people that generally have had a seed round of funding, uh, and or a large friends and family or something like that. So they've raised money and they want to get a product to market. That's okay. that's one third probably of our business. And no, they tend to be seasoned people that that have uh, that can get that funding right. Otherwise, uh, the millennial startups. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble if I generalize here, Ray, but the. Oftentimes, they, there's kind of a wandering in the desert that has to take place, you know, so they, they're forming their team, they're creating, you know, they're testing out what the product is going to be, they're determining what their market is, you know, the competition, there's, there's a lot of discovery that's required. Um, and I would say for those that might be more experienced, they, they're very, they might be clear in terms of what the idea is, but the challenge is the technology. How do I, you know, I have a I, we're trying to accelerate them kind of speed to an actual product. Okay. You know, so this is why there's um, this idea of a minimum viable product is so popular where I don't want to spend millions of dollars to test this out. I want to spend the bare minimum in a very short period of time. I don't want to hire a bunch of people, right? And what we do is we're a group of experts that have done this over and over again, and we can get something out, right? They're... There's also risk of for others where they might choose the wrong technology or stack or things like that. Or make uh, they the might wrong assumptions. Make some wrong assumptions or, or um, I think the, uh, um, I guess really it's they're, they want to validate the idea before they go, go ahead and build their whole team, right? And define their whole strategy. And there's a sense of, you know, you might have a market test, uh, and we've done this locally. There's another firm that we worked with, uh, I have in mind, where they create a ticketing platform, and they were in the printed ticket business for high schools. Okay. And they already had an existing business, and their CEO came and said, you know, we want to own the disruption because someone had approached this company and had at wanted to buy them, uh, because they wanted to create the digital version, right? The, they had an analog business of printed tickets and they wanted a digital version of digital tickets. And so this CEO came and said, can you help us build this platform? We're not in the software business. We're, you know, marketing and sports and printing and that business we know, uh, but we don't know the, 
how to create a digital ticketing platform. Okay. Right? So um, that's a local company here in Alpharetta uh, called Huddle, Huddle Tickets, and the platform is called GoFan. Um, and you might have even used that platform to get into your, you know, the Alpharetta High School football, uh, go buy a ticket. So that's a that's one example that's worked out well. But that's the kind of startup. Okay, so uh, that's area. the maybe the millennial types coming to you with a like I like we have come mm-hmm. to you twice with 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 an idea uh-huh. or, or a dream, and you've got to sort of ratchet it back in mm-hmm. and and talk about objectives and who's your target market and some of it's the funding so the millennials might have more time than they have money and we're really a professional services firm so uh, we don't take stake in in the uh startups it's more of you know you have to pay for the professionals to to build something and get it out and it's your software it's all work for hire so our clients own everything and we're um that's just one part of the business. And it is a little, um, it's difficult because it, it has to move quickly and there's an education that's required for everyone involved, but it's it makes us stronger. And it, it lets us look at everything that's brand new. Um, sometimes uh, startups get an advantage just because of timing, just because technology has changed enough where now is the time for this new idea. Where six months ago, 12 months ago, uh, it was a bad time. Okay. You see what I mean? So sometimes no, I, things can change, you know, so quickly that the timing really matters, you know, and that's something you need to know. Um, so the other part of our business is really, I would say, digital transformation. So the, the last third, the other third, right? So the one third was startups. One third is, um, I would say, digital transformation with mid-tier companies that may or may not be in the software business. I'm seeing many that have an existing software platform, but it might be 10, 15 years old, and they really need it to completely reinvent it. Okay. You completely rethink how this sh- should work, how does it work on mobile, how does it work on voice. They're, they have an existing business and lots of, you know, plenty of users, but they're, part of what they start to see is, like, is they, they come in and they say, we're losing demos. So that's not a good sign, right? And they're, uh, they might be constrained by the technology, by the stack that they're built on top of. Mm-hmm. So they have to really rethink uh, the new stack, right? The, the new technology that they want to use. Sometimes also hardware decisions are important. So maybe they're on an old piece of hardware and they okay. need to be on a new piece of hardware. And they're, they see competitors coming up you know, startups that might, you know, have spent on hardware. So I've seen a lot of different interesting things here. It's surprising how many people are, um, there's sometimes this mindset that I build the software once and it just lasts forever. I can tell you it doesn't last forever. You know, it really, um, you have to be constantly improving it. And it's some, for, for many of these platforms, there is a requirement for a complete re-architecture to take advantage of new tools, new languages, um, new architecture. How do you, you know. how do you guys stay current with that stuff? Well, I mean, part <laughs> of it is to is is uh, learning about always being in it, you know, and never being away from it. And there are certain uh, ways to approach architecture where it's more open, where it's you know, there's a concept of an API. Uh, a pro- programming uh, interface where it's easier for software to talk to other software. And if you if you have a platform where that's not how it was architected, you you will need to make that change. You know, and, and these can be big, expensive things to do. So, um, and we're I think the other part for that is you know for this uh, for the MVPs we might do everything soup to nuts, right? So cover all the design and cover, you know, build everything for that, that middle tier, the digital transformation, we're often, often working with another technical team, you know? So if you're already in the software business, I'm not going to come and tell you about the software business. It's more about how do we, how do we help you kind of run the business that you're in, but also rethink the product, uh, tomorrow's version of the product or the 2.0 version, whatever we want to call it. 
Um, and that's sometimes uh, companies are um, are pushed into that, sometimes because of competitive pressure. Sometimes there could be a private equity placement of, hey, we're going to put a bunch of money in this company, but we're going to expect some real growth and turnaround. Sometimes it's because of an acquisition. Um, a lot of different things, but it, it is interesting. It's more complicated because of uh, when there's an existing platform because um, it's not a greenfield situation, right? So you have to deal with the business that's there, and uh, there are a lot of reasons, entrenched reasons, why they haven't been able to transform, so to speak. So, so it's a little you, more political. You almost have to disrupt the status quo or someone reaches yes. out to you to help facilitate that disruption internally. Sure. Or something it's, like there's that. There's a little bit of change management required, or and, and part of that approach is to make things very, very user focused, right? So one way that we approach things that you know people can kind of get out of the habit of is think about the user first. Customer experience means everything. Remember how I said that we believe that the best return, you know, is from the best user experience, right? So we're trying to improve. We call actually human experience. Okay. You know, all these different touch points have to get better. Um, and we think that investment is worth the return that it can generate. So that's the middle part, middle third. Okay. The last third is really clients who treat us like an R&D team. You know, a little bit of skunk works. Um, they're large firms that come and can't get anything done or need someone to look out on the horizon and think about what's out there and can we pull something forward and start on it now? You know, um, might be, you know, like an industrial distributor. I won't name any names, um, but they, they're they in one business and they're looking about how to move into another one sometimes. So maybe they're trying to move upstream. I'm, you know, I stock parts on a shelf and I sell them for more than I bought them, you know? And they're thinking, I have to solve of my more of my customer's job to be done, right? So a job to be done approach is thinking about how you can do more of your customer's job. What are they hiring you to do? What are they hiring your product to do, right? Or your service or your company? How do I do more of the job that they're trying to get done? Yeah. yeah. Right. And, um, it's been interesting because it typically draws, you know, companies, for example, this industrial distributor I have in mind, it draws them into the service business. It draws them into the software business. You know, uh, it thinks about, okay, you're, um, the customer has a problem they're trying to solve. And just by drop shipping something to that customer's address doesn't really solve their problem, you know, and you don't know much about their problem because all your knowledge stops at the, uh, at the delivery door. You know almost nothing besides everything you've shipped to that customer. But if you solve more of the customer's problem, then you're going to have more insight into what they're trying to do. All right. So this is, sometimes feel more cons consultative, but it's, um, you know, for the larger companies, they need uh, a lot of prototypes, a lot of concepts, uh, still the MVPs to, to drive some internal alignment first, you know, before they invest in anything and before they expose anything externally, they want to be aligned internally. And sometimes for some leadership teams, they need things that are visual, you know, so we talk about things but no one really understands until they see it. So okay. even if we create something that's just a clickable prototype, you know, something that acts like it's um, an application and you can click and move things around, you can get a sense of it. But without that prototype, if it's just a paragraph on a page, no one can really sure. sense what, it, what it's about and how does it solve their customer's problem. And, uh, Anyway, so those are the three areas we work in, the R&D area, digital transformation, and, uh, and startups. It, uh, it's, it's never boring. <laughs> I, I think it sounds, you, you know, I, I have very few regrets in my life, and, but one of them is, is if I could be born again over, I, I would be a code cruncher or something. I just, I love what you guys do. Um, and, and there are some similarities between what you all do and what we do. And one of, one of them is the sense that we get, we get involved in, other, in our clients' businesses. Mm -hmm. Because if we can't understand 
our client's business, then we can't really help them. And, you know, the more, um, the more involved we can get, the more, the more questions we ask, the more um, utility we can create, I think, with our resources for, you know, the client, which um, sounds like what you, you know, similar sure. to what you just said. I, I mean, absolutely. The, the, I've been doing this for quite some time. And uh, honestly, I am usually trying to connect what we do to the strategic objectives of the company, you know, and I don't want, you know, this is might sound bad, but I, I don't really want to be part of somebody's hobby, you know, so typically people really need the help. And, um, for our firm, it's, it's not, um, uh, I mean, well, it's, it is an investment to work with us. So the, I, I want to be sure that we're, you know, the, well, the tip of the spear and we're focused on really achieving objectives and moving the needle for the client because without it, it just starts feeling like this IT project that doesn't end. And, and wow, do I not want to be part of that, right? Yeah, the, or, or, so I, I want to touch users. I want to talk to the users. I want, I want to solve that problem. And sometimes it's a little uncomfortable because we're dragging people in, sometimes into another space or where we might be exposing things that they didn't know. You know or don't want approach. to know. Or don't want to know. And, and it's, not, um, it's not always clear kind of what we're, what we're going to run into. So that makes things exciting because uh, it's not necessarily uh, one person. Um, in, in some of these projects, you can end up with real differences of opinions. And oftentimes I'm trying to uh, quickly get to end users so I can get their feedback so they can be represented. And we have this concept of a product owner, the person who owns the product, who's responsible for driving the product, and that we're, they're not just shooting from the hip saying, try this and do that or, you know, whatever. It's like, well, let's test this idea, get it out with users and listen yeah. <laughs> and, and, and respond to what the users are telling us or showing us in the application. And it's not just shoot from the hip. Let's use some real data mm -hmm. and, and make some, instead of anecdotal assumptions and guesses, you, it sounds like you guys translate something that, that can be measured that can be quantified and um, that's probably part of the filter process that you guys use when when people approach you because I'm sure for you know maybe 10 businesses that come and reach out to you all um, less than 10 are really a good fit for what you know what they need and what you all do and the other ones right um, just for whatever reason aren't aren't They're, there you know, I have to position digital scientists every day against um, offshore competitors, right? As as you know, there's uh, an sure. awful lot of development activity takes place offshore. So if, if a client comes and says, here's this product, can you replatform it from X to Y? And how much is it? I would say, we're not a good fit. That's I'm not interested, actually, because... Uh, that's kind of, you know, purpose built or for being an offshore project where you just, you're not looking to re improve what you have or reinvent or, 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 or something it. tailored. This is, you know, what we call porting, you know, so I'd port from one technology to another one. Uh, we wouldn't do it, you know, and I've, I've, I've also had people come in and say, you know, what? we're not really interested in the users, but we want you to build X. And I was like, no thanks, I'm not yeah. interested. Right, so that's a that's an IT project. So I would say part of our background is more on things that face real users and um, clients and customers, where we need to improve the experience, and it's not. It's more organic. It's, yeah, it's, really. It's, it's not a. I mean, there's there in our business there tends to be agencies and dev shops, and you know, for me, the dev shops are like, you know, what do you have? Um, the take orders. People come in and say, build me this and make it look like that. We've already designed it. That's not us. You know, okay. I'm glad they're there. I think they're important uh, and they're a service. And the agencies tend to be more marketing oriented, more campaign oriented. They build things that might last for a year and then, you know, when the campaign's over, it gets thrown away. 
So when I say we build products, we want to build products that last. Do you, how do you, do you, that implies, and I, I know to a degree you, you, you get involved or you get pulled into maintaining these things that you create. Mm -hmm. And that could, I guess, could get out of hand fast. Well, I, I guess, mean, I mean, how, there's maintenance. Uh, I don't know if that term applies that, that well anymore for, um, for, for a lot of the products that we're talking about, there's really product management. So in product management, you could, you could call it maintenance, but it's, it's really driving the product, right? And if the product, and for many of these companies, the product is the business or a line of business, you know? So the product has to be driven. It's not just manage updates, you know, cause then what that means is it's static. It's not changing. Okay. And in a couple of years, you might just have to throw it out and start over again. You'll be so far behind. So we're, um, I, th I think product management is a, is a discipline that it's new for some, where it's, it's not support, it's not maintenance. It's, it's really you know, the, the driver of the business that is this product or platform. And it has in there, uh, like I said, we talk about product ownership and product management. And for our clients, um, you know, oftentimes that's their title. If not, I give them the title because we'll go in and ask who is the product owner. Okay. And, and sometimes I get blank stares. That's okay. You know, but we're, we talk about them. How do they need to think about the product and features? Again, it's not static. It's not an IT thing. It's not this transactional system that just is one and done. It's you more know. like it sounds like sort of the Steve Jobs approach mm -hmm. to to doing business kind of you're it's all about the the user experience mm -hmm. and the impression that the hardware and the software creates or makes on, on the user and the and the functionality um, but yeah, we, I, I mean, we keep you just keep at it, right? It doesn't it doesn't stop for the the software that you use, even the it's platforms a, it's that a you're tool. on. They're it, just tools. It just it it keeps going. It doesn't you know it's not like in some corporations or something where it's hey I've created this application and we're hardly going to touch it for the next ten years. That what, doesn't exist anymore, right? You you won't keep your users. They'll become disappointed. They'll find some competitive product you know, and, and you're done, you know, so you, you've, you've lost your opportunity. So, um, typically you have to manage and improve that experience any way that you can continuously, right? It's, it's nonstop. And it's hard. A lot of times people try and compare, bring up like construction metaphors with software, which is tough, uh, because you build the house and you're done, you know, um, uh, in a way, maybe this is, it feels like remodeling, nonstop remodeling, you know, of the living room. Uh, you can't just leave it be, you know, it always, it always has to stay current. And the interesting thing is, um, when we talk about experience, it's not just one product. It's really across multiple touch points. So if I'm, if I think the experience drives the return then I need to be worried about every touch point that exists. You know, from when somebody calls in, you know, do they, uh, what's that experience versus the mobile app versus the desktop versus, you know, the Alexa skill? Am I in Google Voice? Is it automated? I mean, it, it starts getting complicated. Fast. Um, and never mind, there could be other, other services that are relevant. So um, I think that's just some of the pressure probably most companies are, are under where, they're going from this mindset of software that may not change that quickly to one where it really does need to improve uh, kind of continuously. Wow. Um, you know, one thing I think that might help is, is it realistic? Can we, so for our listeners, can you, could you talk about just maybe some um, snapshots mm -hmm. of some, some projects or some, some uh, clients and, you know, to translate what you've what you just said into um, sort of dumb it down on how what what you did for a particular client um, simplified. Okay. 
um, and it could be a range. I'm just I'm just curious. I, I, I get what you're saying, but it will help me understand it even better if with a couple of examples. Okay. Maybe. Um, I'm trying to think what would be a good example. The uh, we have a uh, a current client. Uh, they're called uh, Boxlock, and they have a um, it is actually like a smart padlock, right? And so this is a Internet of Things device. So we he actually found us, and we we are part of a, a team of uh, there's us as kind of the mobile software developer, uh, not just mobile, but uh, kind of the the back end and front end for software. Uh, plus, there's a team that that's um, really the mechanical engineering, the folks who actually design the hardware product, the lock itself. And then there's another team that does the uh, the firmware, so the software that lives on the hardware itself. Okay. Right? It's, and it's written in a different language than what we would typically use for either mobile app or, or a, a back-end system. So there's actually three pieces of software and one kind of complicated piece of hardware, all with a startup. Uh, the CEO um, came to us and, and had a... Uh, had kind of a light prototype already done, but wanted to completely update it and renew it. So um, we worked with him to create uh, a minimum viable product for both the user experience on the mobile app and for an admin tool for them in the back end to see what was going on with the users. Um, this product is, like I said, a smart padlock that's... Um, that opens when you scan a barcode, and it's used. He says to uh, for people who want to prevent porch pirates. So porch okay. pirates are apparently the folks that come along uh, once you've had something delivered to your house from from UPS. Let's say they they lift it from your front porch, right? And and because you're not home. So uh, with this, you would put this lock, the box lock, on a on a box that you would have to provide, and then the um, UPS delivery person or FedEx or USPS uh, would use the lock and on a, and they would scan your box and the lock would open. So okay. in the back end, we had to go and grab all the details about everything that's coming to your address. Some of it could be through email. Some of it could be through if you sign up for my UPS or my FedEx or you know all these different shippers also for Amazon. Kind of pull all that information together so um, we would know what was out, that w what was coming well, to your address. What you have to deal right, with. what yeah. we have to deal with. So um, this one was a little complicated because there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, our team loved the complexity and working with the firmware folks and the hardware folks. How long did it take? Um, I guess it's been, f I mean, we've been at it for, uh, this is our second year with him. And... It's kind of comes and stops and starts. So last year he went to CES, you know, the Consumer Electronics Show. Okay. And um, this past October he was on um, Shark Tank, right? So he was on the TV show. Right. And right. Um, it was very tough for him, the founder, because he hadn't sold any yet. And so he had kind of a high valuation. The sharks were merciless. <laughs> wow. I, you know... It was very tough, but he's since, you know, uh, he's been featured on Amazon Prime Day, uh, and he's, he's doing his thing, right? He's, he's as a, as a uh, CEO of a startup, he's, you know, still selling the product. It's available f right now on, on Amazon, and I think he's, you know, trying to sec secure his next round of funding. Okay. Right? So we're kind of along for the ride. Um it's been a lot of fun and and a lot of learning, but it's it's, but it's, a, and it's, it's a it's a significant piece of work too. It's a good good sized piece of work, certainly not the largest, and it, and we have to be ready to stop and start, you know, based on on his needs. And the interesting thing for these startups is sometimes they go in with one idea and one use case, and they might get interest in a whole bunch of other use cases. So through their inter through their interaction exactly, with you so, and your your. Or with You're us asking or just, questions that they haven't thought of before from us and from from others that use the product or just okay. kind of getting press 
they, you know, so they come to market with a, a real B two C use case, and but there are a lot of B B two B applications. Okay, and so that's some of the discovery that most of the startups go through is, what is this really good for? I think this is a great way to solve problem this problem, but somebody else might look at this and say, hey, this solves my problem too. Let's go check it out. And so that's some of the learning that these startups have to go through. And so you, it's hard to predict where they're going to go. But you, you guys know. help. I think you guys really do a lot in helping facilitate them sing. Yes, sing and we these and we respond and we respond where let's add this this functionality and test out this use case. Can we solve this problem for this potential user? Okay. And how do we do it in an inexpensive way, quickly, uh, and get it out there? And I don't have to solve it forever for everyone. It's more of this very narrow case. Can I make this work? So that's a little bit of the give and take, you know. So, for a startup platform, they come and they. It sometimes feels like a point solution. It solves one problem well, but over time, it expands and becomes more of a a, a real platform per se. So it it covers more of that job to be done, more of what that user is trying to get done. Um, back to my example with the uh, the ticketing app, the you know, yes, I have to buy a ticket. Yes, you know, so the, they have to be able to take your money. I have to be able to, you know, have you present the ticket on your mobile phone. Uh, but let's say um, the the high school doesn't want to have a scanner, right? So they, they want to be able to uh, essentially validate your ticket on your phone. So you, if anyone has used Fandango or one of those ticketing apps, you know, to go to the movies here, it works the same way. Okay. So... Why does the movie theater have to have a scanner when everyone has one of these phones in their pockets? You know, and it's typically, uh, it's a fast way to validate, you know, so we can make that happen. But that was not what was in the MVP. Okay. You know, so we want to validate the idea in the MVP and then grow the platform, you know, to account for new features that are needed and new use cases that need to be solved, so to speak, or resolved. Okay. So that's one example uh, and people can check that out. It's uh, I think it's getboxlock.com or something like that or boxlock app. Okay, and they can um, people can go to digitalscientist.com. They can go to digitalscientist.com and see it. Um, there, uh, it is funny where um, we're really heartened and gratified by by our ability to to create help create these products. And you know, it's great even when clients move on and. You know, uh, I just want to be part of their story, you know, and be a good part of their story. And yeah, sometimes yeah. they come back and say, hey, can you help us with that? Sure. If not, you know, they've already got a team and they've gotten larger and they can solve all their own problems. I'm happy to see it. Right. So there's this sense of, you know, for some of these smaller uh, for the startups, it's really build, operate and transfer. So help them build it, help them operate it and then transfer it over to them. Okay. You know, for them to get the funding that they need and the valuation that they need, they have to grow their own team, but we kind of shorten the time to get something to market. I think that's you know? a great great analogy and a great mm -hmm. kind of over broad brush of mm -hmm. one of the main things that you do. So that I mean, that's the part that's never boring. It's not always easy. <laughs> uh, and, and it's interesting, you know, to be approached by these things. There's there really some great ideas out there. Are you um, are you uh, a good mix between public and private um, work? Um, are you do you are, are you mostly? I would think, I guess there would be as much demand uh, in, in the public sector as there would be in the private sector. Is there any? Are real, you mean like publicly traded companies? Versus, no, well, I or, mean, in other words, a, a city coming to you and uh -huh. saying we 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 need to create this, or a, right. a county, or a state, or a versus I, I've tried you know, that it's been really hard I think it's it's difficult to have the necessary funding and at this point um, a lot of these there are a lot of really good platforms that need to be tried out you know there's a sometimes there's just not the uh, investment there to support okay. custom software development Okay. It's I you know I'd be the first one to say it's expensive or there are other tools that are out there that you can pay as you go they're not expensive and you know in the public sector 
uh, budgets can be a very serious constraint and they're and they're not it's not just the budgets it's it's not um it's not the business that they're in right it's it's not really differentiating you know there there aren't enough, i would say that there aren't enough good good tools for them so there's there are things that i've thought about for the public sector but um but but it it, it felt like it would re- would require this outside investment to make it happen okay. you know and it's a big lift to try and sell right so how to bring it to market it's if if your marketing plan is build it and they will come uh i haven't seen that work out very well <laughs> in in uh, our line of business and the i think there's definitely a need there um but the platform approach is can be difficult generally it can be ad ad supported uh which causes problems as well right because um in a way the the public sector has access to these um I don't know, I guess to certain assets and others are interested. I'll give you an example. So the big network providers, you know, the Verizons and AT&Ts, they're interested in selling data plans and creating probably digital versions of these, uh, let's say, events outdoors. So we have the great Taste of Alpharetta here. And we're still in kind of the, uh, we have paper tickets and, uh, it, yeah, we just that's, kind that's of, a it's example. a little uh, outdated a in terms of our approach it is a fabulous event. And I don't, you know, I don't want to get in trouble with folks who put that on cause they do a great job. And it just feels like we have a hard time extending some of these, uh, this technology and platforms to make it a even better event. So the, the vendors who come, you are really there to provide an opportunity for citizens to, to try things. You know, it's all about trial. If you opened a restaurant, I just need someone to come try it, you know, and that's kind of what they're after. But, you know, how does that event connect that vendor to that user? Um, because you just bought a paper ticket and stuck it in a bowl. And yes, you got to try it, but they don't get to send you a, a coupon or a thank you email or anything. Thanks, Ray, for coming and trying yeah. the shrimp and grits. Uh, here's a a little coupon to come try it, come so it's a one off. Try us off, right? So there's there are little things. It doesn't have to be intrusive, and also video and and all these other kind of richer experiences that are coming. But it's it requires the Wi-Fi, the availability, of the data, and plus um, software that could support that. And it's almost like knitting, you know. So how do I knit these things together? And it doesn't have to be creepy and intrusive um and people could opt in i know you know you might ask me questions about that later but well no no that that sort of brings us to my my really my last my last question because i could i could listen for a long time my last question has to do just look in your crystal ball and one of the issues um broad societal issues Mm -hmm. is is the technology and privacy and where where are we where where are we going to end up? And it's no one knows. What, what are your what do you think? Well, <laughs> I'm going to have to be, be pretty measured here, Ray. <laughs> it's a uh, a tough I know it's topic. It's a loaded question. Oh but, yes, but just a little bit. It's uh, a big one. It is, and you know, I've always thought that um, users need to have control over their own data. Right, and users need to be able to to opt in, but know what they're opting in to. And the part of the the challenge, or what I've seen uh, online, is a disconnect between what people think is happening and what's really happening, where their how their data is being harvested and sold, uh, and how you know most people don't know that's going on in the background. Yeah, so, um, and it's it's all about you know driving the, uh, the ads that are being shown, right? So the ads are are paying for the free air quotes internet that's out there. Um, I I've um, you know I I think uh, the um, what was it uh, GPDR, GDPR GDPR um, essentially the European 
requirements around data privacy are really a shot across the bow yep. for the United States. You know, so thinking seriously about privacy and the uh, the opportunity to uh, control to some extent what's out there about you when it's incorrect or you know um, just you know the people need to be able to to move on right with uh, with their lives and not be tormented by what's out on the internet about them um, but the the first and foremost is how do I give the user control over over their own data yep. and and put it within their control to share that data with whomever they want. And I and I'm thinking what's the best way? I mean, I'm I've had some ideas around like in the medical sphere, right? So how to um how to connect a a patient and a caregiver and the doctor so they can they can actually share information and not be worried about where is that going to go? Because yep. they all are interested in solving a problem, and they are solving the same problem, but they're, um, you know, there are a lot uh, of booby traps out there. They, I, we can't do anything. So there, you know, a lot. Again, I can't really extend much of this technology to this to this sphere that's so important to everyone. You know, so for parents taking care of children, or parents taking care of of, of their parents, you know, this is is such an important topic. And we can't even seem to get it right there. So uh, I I don't know. I, I I listen. I watch in terms of what you know our Congress, um, the people in Congress say, and I'm just worried about this gap of well, you, understanding. You know, and and it's a little scary where how far the technology is out ahead of their understanding, and and that may be why we've waited so long with really no. Uh, no privacy rules per se. I mean, I think California passed something uh, last year, but there's not a lot uh, out no. there to protect the consumer. And and you almost, at least I almost, and, and the one thing that puzzles me, and then I, I think we'll let it go, is that the the market hasn't hasn't seen you know hasn't seen this as a as a a great need and it's a great opportunity and run with it. Um, like it does for almost everything else. Um, you know, a, you know, something that is, that, that is private, something that is, is, and sure they make encrypted tools and, but I don't know. I, I just think the market would have done more, um, along these lines. Um, thank you for joining us for the show. It's my pleasure. I'm Bob Klein, and thank everyone for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for Boardroom Buddha and rate the show. We can be followed on Twitter, at Buddha Boardroom, and you can also access Appen Podcast Network channels on northfulton.com backslash podcasts. Have a great day, and remember, in the words of Thomas Edison, and I think he was talking about discovering what to make the filament for the light bulb from. I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Have a great day. Thank you for coming by. Thank you.